Okay, so let's begin again. Um, it's my pleasure to invite the next speaker, uh, Professor Bradley Wilcox, um, who will um, talk about clues to longevity from the Hawaii lifespan studies. So Bradley, if you please, thank you very much. Testing, one, two, three. Hi. <laughs> All right, so uh, I'm delighted to be here. I appreciate the invitation very much. Uh, Oist uh, is a great place. Um, and uh, I'm really happy to be here, I'm especially uh, to, you know, in any way I can, to honor Dr. Suzuki, who, without him, actually, uh, I probably wouldn't be here today. So uh, I met Dr. Suzuki. I'm going to give you a little clue about, okay. I'm from Hawaii, most recently. Originally Canada. But so you know why I'm in Hawaii. Canada's cold, right? Okay. So who's been to Hawaii? You guys don't count. You live there. All right, all right. So uh, I'm going to ask you guys a question. This is like a, my, my slide talk is going to be a question and answer. So uh, who knows where this picture was taken? If you've been to Hawaii, you probably have a clue. Yeah, Honolulu. Come on, let's get more specific here. That's all he's got. Oh. Cheater, he's, he's one of my research colleagues. Yeah, this is from Diamond Head. If, if you've ever hiked up Diamond Head Volcano, that's the picture you see. Okay, so uh, this is where Rich Alsop and I work at John A. Burns School of Medicine, University of Hawaii, which is, uh, that campus was built maybe 15 years ago, so it's like fairly new, and it's right on the beach. So it's really nice, but Rich and I don't get much time on the beach. And this is where our clinical studies occur, Kuakini Medical Center. Okay. Do, has, okay, I'm not going to ask you if, you if you've heard of this place, because <laughs> I'm not going to get any answers. But there's a kind of an interesting story, like Kuakini uh, Medical Center was started in 1899. And it was originally built to um, take care of Jap ethnic Japanese. So in the early 1900s and the late 1800s, a lot of Japanese moved to Hawaii and they worked the sugar plantations, but the, and they needed a place, you know, like a hospital to take care of them. And the medicine there was all in Japanese. Uh, the approach was Japanese. And there were several, I would say, at least a hundred of these hospitals across the U.S. But this is the last surviving one that actually was an original Japanese hospital. I mean, it's English speaking now, but, but it's a really interesting place. So if you get a chance, come by and visit. All right. All right, okay. This is my disclosure. I'm not paid by big companies, mostly National Institutes of Health. But if there's any big companies in the audience, I'm happy to listen to your offers. <laughs> so, oh, this looks like a pointer here. Whoa, it works. All right. This man over there, Makoto Suzuki, changed my life. He actually... Uh, was responsible for my twin brother Craig over there meeting his wife. He was the, what do you call it in Japanese, N Nakoto, Nakoto? Yeah, Nakodo, yeah. So he was like the, what do you call it, like the godfather of his wedding. Yeah. And uh, he actually, because... Um, I got involved with Dr. Suzuki, my twin brother and I, in 1994, uh, which was 
a few years ago, um, he was in, indirectly responsible for meeting, me meeting my wife. I'm not saying whether that's a good thing or a bad thing, but actually it was a good thing. So this is 1994, and I'm not sure if you can see this, guys, but uh, that guy over there is me. Do I look any different? What, better? Did you say better? All right, much better, okay. I'm not sure how much, you know. Much better is good, because I, if I have to make it, make it a little bit more, I'm gonna owe you a lot of money for saying these nice things. All right, so this is Craig. It's that guy over there, my twin brother. Yeah, you can see he's a very friendly guy. Like he's got his arm around one of our research associates. This is the original uh, location at University of Ryukyu's, uh, the main uh, university in this, this uh, prefecture. Chikyo Irio Bu, right? So that's where Dr. Suzuki did all his stuff, chasing down those centenarians and uh, putting their blood samples in the freezer there and trying to figure out why they live so long. And uh, this is after Craig and I, well, actually, me. I moved to Hawaii in, hmm, help me out, guys. Uh, come on, what century? Huh? All right, I moved there, actually, uh, in 2002. Yeah, so I had been working with the, the sensei here for over eight years, like coming back and forth, back and forth th through my training. I'm a geriatrician. So, you know, uh, but interested in obviously longevity research. And this was 2002. And uh, I won't ask about aging for this one. Let's go next. Okay. All right, so this is the first centenarian I ever met in Okinawa. Sensei, you remember this? Obotere? Huh? Yeah? What was his name? I think it was Nakasone. Any Nakasones in the audience? Well, Nakasone is a common last name. You can't throw a stone in Okinawa without hitting a Nakasone. But I couldn't, you know, we went to this guy's place. I mean, does this guy look 100? No. Okay, that's the right answer. Right. So we actually were kind of, uh, Craig and I, you know, we're, uh, Craig was doing his graduate work in Okinawa on, uh, he's an anthropologist, that's why he's got the shaggy hair and the beard. Uh, I'm a geriatrician, more, kind of more respectful. And, uh, but I had a beard back then, so I didn't look too bad. But this guy, we, we actually went to his place and we didn't, we had no idea. Like, I mean, this is, I was really excited because I, I was really interested in longevity and this is the first centenarian I ever met um, in Okinawa. So Craig and I, you know, Craig had a driver's license at that time. And uh, we, we found, you know, after, I don't know if you guys have driven much around Okinawa, but all these twists and turns, but we found his place. We go right there, that's, that's uh, his little balcony, Lanai. He's, he's getting his heel bone density tested here for, you know, to see his uh, bone density, right? And uh, we said, Okay, we're here to meet the centenarian. <laughs> we saw him. We're, we're here to meet the centenarian. And he's, uh, where's the centenarian? <laughs> he's like, I'm the centenarian. We're like, uh, really? Okay. But he was actually extremely healthy. Uh, and he had, we did, you know, lots of tests on him. And, but, uh, but that was sort of my, how shall I say, Introduction to Okinawan longevity. People, that guy looks, he doesn't look like a centenarian, but you know, they age more slowly here, or at least, at least they used to. We'll see how it goes for the next few generations. So, I've been in Hawaii since 2002, and uh, we work very closely with uh, Dr. Suzuki, with my twin brother over there, Rich Alsop, who's a uh, telomere stem cell guy at the University of Hawaii. 
Uh, we have lots of collaborators all over the world. Uh, and we have a team, like an amazing team, that uh, collects a lot of really good data. And we have a study that, has gone, that was started in 1965 with middle-aged men of uh, Japanese and Japanese Okinawan ancestry, 8,006 men. And we've followed them, well, there's eight alive now. Youngest is 104. So this is what we do. This is my day job, all right? I get paid to do this. So I run the Center for Translational Research on Aging. Uh, we have uh, this, uh, we have a sample biorepository. So if you're looking for brains, we've got a thousand of them in our brain bank. And uh, we have, the whole point of it is to train junior investigators, like assistant level uh, professors to become aging experts. So one project we have is on, uh, who's heard of this gene called FOXO3? Panel, wake up guys. <laughs> All right, no response. All right, so this is the, uh, the biggest gene in human longevity. I'll tell you about, a little bit about it later. So what we're doing with this project is uh, a CRISPR project, which, you know, this is uh, a big technology institute, so I'm sure they're doing CRISPR here. So we are engineering an extra copy of the FOXO3 gene into a mouse. So theoretically, this longevity gene should, you know, do what genes do, express the protein, and impact healthy aging. So far, it's, it looks like it's working. Um, this one, uh, we're looking at the relation of stem cells and telomeres to this FOXO3 gene. The whole concept of this is about the FOXO3 gene. I'll tell you more about that later. Uh, this one's about brain aging. This one's about stroke. All right, let's move on. All right, so if you're ever in Hawaii, look me up. This is our medical center. Uh, you won't recognize this. It's, it's our biorepository. And it's actually, you wouldn't believe this. Okay, this, so this is, was, place was established in, like I say, 1900, and we, we have 500,000 biological samples in that biorepository, and 1,000 brains, because our, our people, our guys that, you know, uh, worked with us for over 50 years were really dedicated study subjects. So, that, so I'm, okay, this is not gonna be an exciting talk. I'm sorry if you, you know, I'm following up after Michelle Poulin. Michelle, where are you? Yeah, uh, nobody can follow up after that guy. He was, he had all these good jokes and stuff, he's really funny and I'm never gonna follow up after you again. Because I'm, you know, I, I have nothing in comparison. So this is just to give you an idea what we do in Hawaii, we have, uh, almost 60 years of follow-up on 8,000 American men of uh, Japanese and Japanese o Okinawan ancestry, about 15% of the cohort is Okinawan, uh, mother and father that were born in Okinawa. And uh, we have a lot, you know, the, 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 the really interesting thing about this study is, okay, if you wanna study human aging, you gotta follow these people, right? For a long time. See how they age. So they say they're say their average age 50. Well, now they're if they made it, 132 of them made it over 100. And so then you bank their biological samples, their blood, whatever else, tissue, uh, all the, their medical information, and then you see what are the keys to why some lived to be over 100 and some didn't. All right. Okay. Um, who, uh, all right, I'm going to make this really quick. So what's recognized in terms of the, how shall I say, the genetics of human longevity, of course, everybody's doing like big genome-wide sam sample studies, et cetera, et cetera, but there's only two genes that have really, really been shown repeatedly. I'll call them the A team, right, to be, uh, implicated in human longevity. And the first set of genes were from 
Dr. Suzuki published. Not, everybody forgets this study, but you guys won't because you've heard it. APOE, everybody knows about APOE. What does APOE do? Huh? Lipids, yes. And it's also, you know, because it, uh, it affects lipid dynamics, it also affects dementia. So it's the major risk gene uh, for uh, dementia in humans, Alzheimer's, if you have the APOE4 version. But if you've got the E2 version, it's protective. So this was uh, a nearby colleague of ours at, uh, in New York. He discovered this lipid, also another lipid gene, interestingly, that if you have the right copy, you get high levels of good cholesterol, and your, your dementia risk goes way down. And no, but nothing really happened in the whole field until we discovered this FOXL3 gene in 2008. And I'll tell you a bit more about that. All right. I think we talked about this. APOE, FOXL3, they're the stars. You know, there's a, some up-and-comers. Uh, there's a few that have, you know, mostly, you know, you hear about these studies and uh, they say, oh, this gene's implicated in human longevity. The vast majority of them are never replicated. So replication, replication, replication is the key. And these are the two most replicated genes. So we think they're real. So if you're going to have a longevity-associated gene, it, can't, it has to be uh, something, I think, uh, that influences multiple ways that we age. And that's exactly what happens with this gene. Who, who knows their FOXL3 genotype here? <laughs> it's it's all, always those Hawaiian guys over there. Yeah, all right. So one out of every three people in this room has the longevity genotype. And, I, and I'm not, this is like kind of important. It makes a lot of difference about like life planning, that sort of thing. If you have the longevity genotype, you're going to be around probably for a long time. So you might think about buying long-term care insurance, but not life insurance, right? So, uh, but it works through multiple pathways. And you can see all these mechanisms of aging here. All right. So we, we actually, what we did in uh, 2008 was we, we looked at... Um, model organisms of aging, like mice and uh, flies and worms, and we all share common uh, genetic pathways, right? So we said, well, what are the things that are happening in the model organism models, and what is the human equivalent of that gene? So then we tested our people, those are people that live to be 95 plus years of age, those that died at an average age, and said, what's the difference? Turns out that one gene was the big one. And it f worked mainly on reducing your risk for coronary heart disease. So that, you know, obviously, if, like if you're in the US, uh, it's the leading cause of death. If you're in here, cancer's the leading cause. But it does, you know, in some studies, it, uh, it's also involved with cancer, but not so much in the American population. So why, do, why does this stuff, why is it important? It's because if you just, you know, you figure out what these genes are and how they work, then maybe, you know, you could possibly uh, activate those genes, you know, by nutritional or, you know, drugs or, so that's, you remember Brian Kennedy giving his, his talk earlier, these genes, look at these pathways, yeast, worms, flies, mammals, so there's Foxo, there's Foxo, DAS16 is the FOXL version of worms, and uh, it's important all across these species. So you can think about, okay, genes from a, like a multi-omic perspective, you know, lots of uh, different genes, and they all influence pathways, they talk to each other, stuff happens, and it influences like how the rate of your aging. But we were quite interested in this, what, how FOXL3 works. Okay, we study our people and we, we know that, okay, it, it decreases risk for coronary heart disease, right? That's the big killer in the US, in our population. And, uh, but what else does it do?
so uh, this is quite interesting, at least to me. Uh, so we have, you know, what, what I think, you know, we're, we're thinking about genes now, obviously in networks, they talk to each other. Genes don't just sit there and, and uh, be quiescent and not do anything. They're turning on, they're like a you know, keyboard on the computer. They're turning on, turning off, making proteins and stuff. You know, going, you know, the protein goes into the bloodstream and influences other genes. And so it's a dynamic network. So we're trying to figure out, okay, well, how does this gene work? We think it is a peripheral master regulator that uh, regulates other genes. It's like a, how shall I say, a, like a housekeeping gene, right? If you uh, have issues, it takes care of them. Otherwise, it wouldn't have such a big impact on aging. So, okay, all right, this might get a little complicated, but the bottom line here is this is actually something uh, I found really fascinating when we did this study, is that, okay, this gene sits on chromosome six, right? So you think genes, well, they're gonna like be working on all kinds of other chromosomes. But this gene, part of why it's important is it lives in this neighborhood and it talks to other genes. There's about 20, 20 plus genes in this little neighborhood on chromosome six. If you go beyond that, like it's where these genes are, it's like a gene desert, nothing's going on. So this gene basically talks to other genes. Now, this is gonna be interesting for you. Okay, guys, what do you see here? This is uh, in situ hy hybridization, basically, we're putting, uh, uh, how shall I say, colors on genes, right? So these are some of the genes that FOXL3 talks to, right? And when you, when you stress the body, this is a stress resistance gene, they come together, just like in Okinawa. The Obachan, you know, when there's a problem, comes knocking on your door, says, hey, let's all get together and figure this out. That's what this gene does. And this is like, this is actually physically moving. It's moving through chrom chromatin loops. So it's, it's quite interesting. All right, so uh, obviously these are some of the mechanisms that we found out that it are in this gene neighborhood and what enhances longevity. Okay, Whoa. okay, we're getting to the, I tend to drone on and on. You know, normally there's a, like a cane or something that just yank me off the stage, but Okay, I'm going to show just a little video about how this gene works, and then I think we're pretty much done. Just like some well-made cars, some people last longer than others. They don't fall apart. They don't even need replacement parts. What's up with that? You know, if medical researchers figure it out, then maybe everyone could last longer. Correspondent Zaya Tom tracked down some lucky folks who don't age like most of us, and the doctors who were trying to figure out the secret to their fountain of youth. So how'd I do? Some people are like forces of nature. Aging gracefully is simple for them. My name is Chuck Yogi. I'm 91 years old, ever since the last couple of days. So I'm fully 91. Somehow, James Harai got to 91 too. I've been blessed with uh, good health, I guess, you know. Kind of makes you wonder how they do it. Do you have a secret to looking so young at 90? Just don't worry about unnecessary things, you know? I'm happy go lucky. <laughs> but while these guys are living proof that longevity comes naturally for some, other people are pulling out all the stops to try and live as long as they possibly can. Computer scientist and inventor Ray Kurzweil takes 150 pills every single day. That might sound like a lot, but it's not enough to just be natural. If I take 400 milligrams a day of resveratrol, a lot of vitamin D. So what's he doing with all those pills? In my view, death is a great robber of all the things that give meaning to life. It destroys knowledge and wisdom and relationships. And there's actually a lot that you can do to slow down these aging and disease processes. But is Ray wasting his time looking for a fountain of youth that's just a myth? The goal right now is to live long enough to get to a future point where we will have technologies that will extend our longevity even further. 
In fact, scientists have been tinkering in the lab trying to extend life for a long time. And they've come up with a couple of things that do work in animals. Calorie restriction, for instance. Basically, putting an animal on a diet seems to kick in a survival response and helps it live longer. And they found a substance in red wine that has a similar effect. But what if somebody could figure out how these guys did it so effortlessly? The fish is not cooperating today. I think the camera shy. We found one gene that was heads and shoulders above everything else, and that was the FOXO gene. The FOXO gene, that's right. The same superintendent gene that helped double the life of Cynthia Kenyon's tiny worms. Though everybody has the FOXO gene, these Hawaiian men seem to be living longer, healthier lives because they have a protective version of FOXO. We found that if you have this FOXO gene, you have a twofold chance of living to 100. And if you have two copies of this, you have a threefold chance of living to 100. A gene typically consists of two copies. You get one copy from your mother and one copy from your father. So with FOXO, the area that we looked at, you could have a C or a G from your mom and your dad. The vast majority of us have two Cs. About 25% of us have one G and one C. And about 10% have two Gs. If you have two Gs, you hit the jackpot. That's triple the odds of living to be 100. You can go to Vegas with those odds. I'm not very good at this, but I read palms a little bit. And believe it or not, you actually have an incredibly long lifeline. No kidding. Yeah, you do. <laughs> and not only triple your odds of living that long, but being healthy. So it was a gene that appeared to be associated with extended health span, not just lifespan. It tells us that FOXO in humans affects aging. You could have imagined that we have the gene, but it doesn't do the same thing. But this says it does. News of the Hawaii study sped around the world, and scientists confirmed the results in population after population in Germany, Italy, New England, California, and in China. Near Barzilai of the Albert Einstein College of Medicine in New York, I am now 98 years old, also found a similar pattern in the FOXO genes of Ashkenazi Jewish centenarians. 96, 97, 98. This data on the FOXO pathway that came from Hawaii and then confirmed by us was confirmed by other groups and in fact it's the most consistent validated study in this field suggesting that this is real and important for human aging and longevity. You don't feel old, you feel young. And it's also consistent with what we have learned that there's this whole concept of a superintendent that is regulating whatever is going in the house. Oh, you got already going, going. And in the future, that knowledge could be used to develop new drugs to combat age-related diseases. Sure. And perhaps someday to help us live longer. Good job, Mr. Harai. The vast majority of us get an average set of genes. So it's what you do that becomes most important. Eating a good diet, regular physical activity, engaged in life. As you age, I think every little thing pleases you more than in the past. And now I got to aim for the uh, century mark, yeah. So how do you think you're going to celebrate your 100th birthday? 100 candles? It would be a fire hazard, huh? Yeah, it would be a fire hazard. <laughs> Thanks very much, guys. Uh, do we have time for one question, or are you going to pull me off with the cane? No, we have time for one question. Oh. Thank you very much, Bradley Wilcox. <laughs> so it'll be a short question and possibly a, s a short answer. So you had 15% Okinawans in your cohort. Was that by design, or is it just the situation due to migration that has turned up that? Yeah, it was, uh, we recruited 90% uh, of uh, all American men of Japanese an ancestry, including Okinawans. So there's a lot of immigration into Hawaii from, or has been over the years, from Okinawa. So they, they, they you know, in terms of like in Japan, what, like one or two percent, three percent of the population, but in Hawaii, they're 25 percent of the Japanese American population. Yeah, so it's given us a really nice data set to sort of track these guys and see what goes on with them. Yeah, I was thinking that as well, so great. Thank you very much. Great, Thank you very much. Great talk. Thank you very much. Thank you, guys. The next, the next uh, uh, speaker is uh, Professor David Le Couture. Uh, and uh, 
he will speak about macronutrients, aging, and the Okinawa ratio. I would also like to uh, just mention that uh, David, together with um, Stephen Simpson, have uh, written a great review on this subject in the Journal of Internal Medicine. So it's it's really a great review. You can you will find it um, uh, downloadable. So, uh, David, welcome, and we look forward to your talk. Okay. Well, I come Bradley, I'll start by saying I can't follow that. <laughs> Sorry, Brad. But, um, my name's David Lacuda. I'm a geriatrician from Sydney, as you can probably tell from the accent. And I guess I'm more comfortable talking about patients than on mice, but this is a, this is a talk about mice. And uh, I thought I was giving this talk actually tomorrow. But um, <laughs> anyway, that's the nature of it. Um, so I'll be focusing on macronutrients, dietary macronutrients and their effect on ageing, and I'll introduce you to something that I've called the Okinawan Ratio. I have a, a number of conflicts of interest. Um, probably the main one is the bottom one there, because um, I had a DBS, a, a Medtronic DBS inserted into me at the end of last year from the Parkinson's disease. None of them will in influence what I say, but the bottom one will influence how I say it. So if I get a bit shaky or a bit quiet, that's the reason. Um, the work is really, really based on two, what I consider to be really quite remarkable nutritional biologists um, from Oxford. One's uh, Steve Simpson in the pink shirt and David Rabenheimer. And when they were in Oxford, they really tried to understand the, the way that nutrition interacts with a whole range of um, sort of uh, uh, behaviours and outcomes. And then Steve moved to Sydney to take over that institute. You can see down the bottom there, the um, Charles Perkin Institute. But they hadn't thought about ageing. So when they moved to Sydney, I, um, I spoke to Steve a bit about ageing and caloric restriction, and he hadn't really thought about it, and it's now become a major interest of his. Uh, by the way, he gives his apologies um, as a per an email just then, to, because he's in Paris in spring with his wife. Um, so the, the first set of experiments Steve did to try and work out whether it's the macronutrients or the ratio of macronutrients or calories that influenced um, lifespan or longevity, these experiments were done in Drosophila. And they're sort of reasonably complicated experiments in that you have to test a lot of diets, a lot of different diets. So in this experiment, there were 25 different diets varying in protein and carbohydrates, and caloric restriction was induced by dilution, which is fairly easy for Drosophila. And uh, what he found here, I mean, all of these graphs are pretty much the same. Uh, is that showing up there? On the x-axis, you've got the amount of protein eaten. On the y-axis, you've got the amount of carbohydrates eaten. And in the middle is a heat map. Heat map is the sort of smoothed average of what happens over those full 25 diets. And what you can see here in the, in the red, the red's the longest diet, the, the longest lifespan, and the blue is the shortest lifespan. And the result's pretty obvious, isn't it? That the, the Drosophila that were maintained on the um, low protein, high carbohydrate diets lived longest, and those were on the high protein, low carbohydrate diets lived the shortest. And caloric restriction, which would be sort of as you move down towards the zero point there, had no effect. So they published that, and then Steve came to me and said, can we do this in mice? And I stupidly said, yes, of course. Um, so we had then, we had to think about fat as well, because Drosophila don't normally eat um, pro, uh, fat, but uh, obviously mice do. So this was a study with about 25 different diets, varying in the amount of protein, the amount of carbohydrates, and the amount of fat. And again, we sort of managed to generate ca caloric restriction, but we managed to do it by dilution, because all these animals are ad libitum and fed. And the way that we did that was to... Um, to dilute their food with non-digestible cellulose. So the animals tended to eat a bit more because they were hungry, but they were about 30% energy restricted or caloric restricted. And the results are almost identical to what was seen with the, um, with the Drosophila, in that the mice with the longest lifespan up here were the ones on the low protein, high carb diets, and the ones with the shortest lifespan were the high protein, low carb diets. And for those of you that are more familiar with Kaplan-Meier curves, here what I've done is plotted all of the couple of my curves for the different protein to carbohydrate ratios. And you can see it goes from the highest here, the highest dumb protein in the diet to the lowest protein in the diet. The colours match the PC ratio almost perfectly, which is sort of very interesting. And uh, after a couple of years, that really satisfied Steve that this probably was something in mammals. So then I went and sort of had a look at what other data had been published in the area following that, and there'd been Several studies that I've found that have looked at the same mechanism, the same model of, um, or the same methodology to see whether it's the protein or the carbs 
that influence longevity. And as you, you don't need to be an expert in the geometric framework, but all those patterns look fairly much the same, don't they? That all of them, it's the low-protein, high-carb diets with the longest longevity, and the high-protein, low-carb diets with the, with the shortest um, longevity. Now, all those ratios of protein to carbs are around 1 in 10. If, you're, uh, if you give the animals the, um, the option of eating whatever food they like, you don't just restrict them to a single diet, they always go for a higher protein diet. And if you look at what maximizes fertility, it's a higher protein diet. So there you are, I have a choice between um, sex or aging. Uh, now, we got asked to write this review, and, and um, as you can see here, the usuals for the, all the other talks here, with, um, with Craig and, uh, and Bradley, and asked whether what was happening to the Okinawans, Islands, whether, what was happening with their macronutrient ratio. And uh, they said that the traditional Oki Okinawan diet had about 9% um, protein and about 85% carbs, which is exactly the same as what we saw with all those insects and with the mouse study. Incredible, isn't it? So the Okinawans have somehow titrated their ratio of protein to carbs to match what we think is the optimum one for um, longevity. So hence the Okinawan ratio. They haven't changed much, probably, have they? These ones, anyway. But it's, it's maybe not quite as simple as that. So we took that, those same data and looked at age-specific mortality to see if there's any change with what um, protein to carbohydrate ratio you might need as you get older. Because as we know, in older humans, there's a, quite a lot of pressure to try and get people to eat more protein to improve their sarcopenia and their frailty. And in fact, this shows that probably, well, it shows that in mice at least, the, the lowest um, mortality, so the blue here is the best, um, is with that Okinawan ratio of about 0.1, up until the mice are about 100 weeks old, which is pretty old, and you can see it, then it moves up and the, the protein to carbohydrate to minimise the um, age-specific mortality um, increases. Um, so then the, the question comes up, well, you know, how, how does this compare to caloric restriction? Um, if we give our animals the low-protein, high-carb diets, how does that, how does that look if, um, compared to caloric restriction? And if we give them the double whammy of caloric restriction and low-protein, high-carbohydrate diets, does that have any beneficial effects? And to cut a long story short, because these studies were reasonably short-term, they were done at um, Rafa de Carbo's lab, um, the animals were given the low-protein, high-carb diets up and 5 to 10, 5 to 60 percent protein, so we really stressed these mice nutritionally. And then caloric restriction by the usual way, not by diluting their food, but just giving them less food so they're hungry. And the, the blue shows the, uh, the red shows the um, the different diets, so this is the lowest protein diet and the highest protein diet, and the blue shows the same thing except with caloric restriction. And I guess what you can see there is that the blue and the, and the lowest protein diets are similar. They weren't statistically different, but obviously there's a trend there. So from my, the, the low protein diet was maybe not quite as good as caloric restriction when it came to these metabolic short-term outcomes. So I think if you don't want to be hungry, then probably a low protein diet's the way to go. If you're happy to be hungry, then stick with caloric restriction. Um, so then we move to a few mecha mechanisms, and it's a shame I, I'm not giving this talk tomorrow because I was going to add a little bit about the microbiome, because what we found was that the microbiome could be very simplified by this approach in terms of analysing the outcomes, because there are really two types of microbiome in terms of each of the, the um, I guess, the species or the strains or whatever you call the DNA that you get from faeces. And uh, they basically said that it, within the microbiome, there were two types of microbiome, populations, the one that was turned on by high protein, the one that was turned on by high carbs, and that was it. However, for this talk, I've just chosen these four mechanisms and um, that I'll show you a little bit of data about, but they're obviously, you know, they're, they're pretty familiar to all of us, except FOXO, which I haven't put there. Um, so we looked at mTOR, phosphorylation, um, we looked at mitochondria, we looked at telomere length and FGF21. Uh, macronutrient ratio um, versus phospho mTOR. Again, as we expected, in these animals who were on the eating the low protein, high carbohydrate diets, the ones that were on the, the diet that made them live longer had the least amount of phospho, uh, phospho, phosphorylation of mTOR. And those that were on the high protein diets had the highest amount of, um, of uh, um, phosph phosphorylation of mTOR. And if we, if we took that a step further and we looked at the blood levels of branched chain amino acids and glucose, we got exactly the same figure. And then, in fact, if we did that in vitro, we just varied the amount of branched chain amino acids as a marker of the protein intake. And glucose, we got exactly the same sort of um, 
uh, surfaces. So I guess there's no surprises there. Um, a low protein diet is good for mTOR. Um, but this one I think is a little bit interesting, or a little bit sort of interesting, because I didn't really understand it at the time. When we published those first data, the mitochondrial um, function studies that were done by Seahorse sort of didn't fall out the way that I expected. I expected the low protein, high carb diets to be, um, you know, good for uh, good for mitochondria, and we weren't actually seeing that. And some subsequent experiments, we found that um, one of the one of the chief things that the high protein diets did in terms of the liver was to sort of ramp up their mitochondria. Really quite a dramatic effect and probably the main effect of high protein diets was to push the mitochondria hard. And um, that was in terms of transcription and, and their um, uh, protein abundance. And then I thought, well, if, if the mitochondria are working harder, then why is a low, high protein diet bad for you? And I wondered whether it might be oxidative stress. So we, we looked at oxidative stress in the liver you can see out here that the animals that were on the really high protein diets were the ones with the oxidative stress. And that effect could be reversed to some degree by metformin and rapamycin. And then uh, this is for Rich, uh, who's uh, the telomere king. Um, we also looked at telomeres in the liver, which is not done terribly often, um, but we were looking at telomere length. And again here, th these are the graphs that I showed you before up here the lifespan or longevity, showing that the animals with the low protein, high carb diets are the longest, and here's the telomere length in the liver. The, the, the graphs, are, the, the um, surfaces are absolutely superimposable. So it seems like low protein diets are good for your telomeres as well. Um, FGF21, similar result. The FGF21 was really ramped up in the low protein diet. So the animals that were on low protein diets had really quite very high levels of FGF21. And what I've shown in that other slide there is that if you knock out FGF21, this is work done by, um, I think, Douglas Lamming's lab with Crystal Hill as the first author. Um, they found that if you knock out FGF21 from the mice, they don't respond to a low protein diet. So FG, FGF21 obviously has a, has a key role here. Um, okay, and then just to finish up, how can we, how can we undo the goods of a low protein diet? And this is not really the reason we did these experiments, but that's the way that they turned out. So, as I said, the, the branch chain amino acids seemed to be the thing in the blood that changed with the high protein diets, and we felt that that was probably bad for the mice that turned on their mTOR. So we decided to do an experiment where we supplemented B, um, the branch chain amino acids, and we did some experiments where we limited or restricted the amount of branch chain amino acids in the diet of these animals. And what we found was that the, the limitation of branch chain amino acids didn't really have any effect on longevity but the branch chain amino acids, for those of you that are bodybuilders, um, they, they made you fat, they made you eat more, but if we reverse their obesity by giving them less food, then they, their lifespan was normal. So the branch chain amino acids increase your appetite, make you hungry, and you become fatter, you don't get increased lean, which is probably not what the um, bodybuilders want to hear. Um, then we were looking at the carbohydrates, because the carbohydrates that we gave the animals were pretty much the standard sort of carbohydrates that you get in a... In a, in a um, a mouse chow, we wanted to look hard at that concept of can you undo the good of a low protein diet by changing the amount of glucose and fructose in their diet. And the interesting thing here was that the, it was, if you had a full amount of glucose, no problem. If you had a full amount of fructose, no problem. But that 50-50 combination of glucose and fructose was the one that drove all the bad things that occurred with, with, um, with uh, the, the, the high fructose corn syrup that many Americans eat. So the animals with a 50-50 combination of glucose and sucrose, they were the ones with the fatty livers and the high insulins and so on. And then just finally, we, we have a cohort of older men, which um, Rich has been in, in Sydney doing the FOXO genes on, you'll be pleased to know. Um, but in this CHAMP cohort, we also have very good dietary data, as well as their lifespan. What we found that if you're going to fiddle with the protein and go for an, uh, plant protein, that's something that obviously we all know, the actual figures were sort of nicely um, balanced in that for each serve of animal protein that you had, had um, extra, that increased your chances of dying by 25%, and each, um, each serve of plant protein that you had reduced your um, chances of dying by 25%. So think about that tonight over dinner. <laughs> so I only really have two messages. One is that macro macronutrients matter. It's not all just about energy, then that's probably the ratio of macronutrients is as important as anything else. And if you want to be really healthy, then go for the Okinawa ratio, that protein to carbohydrate ratio of around about one in 10. Um, so with that, I'll say thank you. Uh, 
obviously a lot of acknowledgements here. Thanks, and I'm happy to take any questions that you might throw at me. Thank you very much for an excellent uh, talk. Um, I think Aqua has a question. Yeah, thank you for a great presentation. I have one uh, question. With regards to macronutrients, have you considered about the fat intake for all those uh, animal uh, experiments? Or if you have controlled, would you be able to let us know, you know how you have done it? Um, in terms of longevity, yeah, those experiments, we did adjust fat as well over a big range. So that's why we had the three graphs, the protein versus fat, carbohydrate versus fat, and protein versus carbs. We didn't find fat had any effect at all. Very interesting. Thank you. Uh, let's see. I have a, one more question. So are you saying, um, I mean, the, the branched-chain amino acid um, supplementation studies, is that um, a way to, I mean, are you saying or showing that those are the ones that are driving obesity or are you saying there are more that's just a model for uh, a bad uh, diet that also has other things um, do you see what i mean i do and i guess the problem is food is complex and playing with one variable probably is not going to be terribly helpful Oh, I just say that because, you know, I know that going to a gym that there are a lot of people there that believe that branched chain amino acids are good for them. And if you actually talk to them, yeah, they put on weight, but they put on fat, they don't actually put on lean, which is what they're wanting to do, build up their muscle. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, okay, thanks a lot. So we would like to welcome the final presenter. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Joris Dillin from Max Planck Institute for Biology of Aging, Genomics and metabolic, uh, Metabolomic Profiles as a Cause of Longevity. Can I go back? <laughs> ah. Yes, first of all, I would like to thank the organizers for giving me the opportunity to talk about uh, my work here. I was waiting for this conference already for two and a half years, so I'm f happy that it's uh, finally happening. And today I want to tell a bit more about the work that I'm doing at Functional Genomics. So we follow up genetic variants uh, in vitro and in vivo. But I first want to start off by some general data, of course, that you all know about lifespan in humans. So this is actually data from the Netherlands, so from different bird cohorts from the 1850s, 1900s, and 1950s. And as you can see very clearly, the lifespan curves is really shifting to the right. So we see that people get, get older and older. <clears throat> However, this is also accompanied by a, is not accompanied, sorry, by an increase in also the health span of these individuals. So we get older and older, but we also get sicker, uh, at least most of the people get sicker. However, if we look at the extreme end of the spectrum, and that's also what we are talking about here today mostly, these very long-lived individuals, we know from previous studies already from a long time ago that these individuals actually show compression uh, of late-life morbidity. So they are potentially a, a nice model to study also healthy aging uh, by directly looking at these extremely long-lived people. So what research is always complicating is that if we have these long-lived individuals, ideally if we want to compare them with a ideal population, it would be, for example, their partners or other people that already died before them. However, this is often not possible. So what we have done in Leiden and also several other studies in the world is actually that we do not look at these long-lived individuals themselves, but we actually look in their offspring. So this is the second generation. And the second generation should be aware, should share about half of their genome with their parents. And the nice thing there is that we actually have the partners of these individuals, and these live in the same environment. So if we compare the two, we hopefully identify uh, processes that could be contributing to longevity. And this has been a lot of work over the past 20 years, I would say. And the most things that, and the things that we are mainly seeing is that these individuals, also this offspring, have also decreased prevalence of age-related diseases, a lower risk of mortality, improved physical functioning, and also have healthier levels of different kind of uh, factors, such as things involved in glycemic control, lipid metabolism, and thyroid metabolism. This also shows again that, that lifespan or longevity actually is probably heritable. So several people talked already about the, the heritability of longevity versus lifespan. I want to talk about the heritability of longevity, defined as living to an extremely old age. Because with lifespan we know that the heritability is about 15%. 
However, we think that for longevity, this is stronger. We don't know exactly how strong this heritability is, but what we do know is if we take this 10% longest lift of a given birth cohort, then it's actually heritable over different generations, independent of the environmental factors. So there definitely is a genetic component of longevity, but not an, not, first of all, we don't know how big it is. Second, we actually think that it's very complex. And the reason that we think it's complex, I come back to that in a minute. So we think actually that it's likely determined by many different genes that each have a small effect. And it can well be that in one individual, it's not just one variant, very likely it's not one variant contributing, but it's actually multiple variants at the same time. <coughs> so the goal of the research in the genetics is actually we study these long-lived individuals, look at their DNA, try to identify the mechanisms that contribute to them living very long and healthy. And this is also what my group has been doing already for a long time. And I, I started with this work already when I was still a PhD in a group of Aileen Slagboom in Leiden. Um, so the first thing that we started to do was looking at this common genetic variant. So variants that are very prevalent in the population, at least 5% of the people carrying them. However, if we look at such variants, it's often the case that the effect size is probably low. So even if you carry them, the chances that you live longer are actually quite small in comparison for example, to rare variants for monogenetic diseases. So this is a kind of a summary of all the work that has been done on the genetic association studies of uh, longevity in the big population. So these are the genome-wide association studies. So not the Canada gene studies that were talked about before, but really the genome-wide association studies. One thing that is very striking here is that, again, of course, we find APOE, where we see that in many different study populations, the APOE4 allele is associated with a decreased risk of becoming long-lived. And we actually show in the biggest one that we did that APOE2 shows the opposite effect. This was not new, of course. This was already shown before in the Canada gene studies. But what is very striking is that all the other things that are mentioned here have not been replicated across different genome-wide association studies. So in the studies, they have been replicated across populations, but they have not been replicated across studies. So this makes it also very complicated. Another thing that I want to mention here, because FOXO is, is so important to some people, strikingly, FOXO does not pop up in genome-wide association studies. And the reason is, yes, it's consistent across populations, but it's not present in all populations. So, for example, in the Dutch population, the effect of FOXO3 is not there. So that's why it's likely not popping up in this kind of studies. And this is then actually the effect of APOE4, which in my view is the strongest risk factor for longevity. So what you can see on the left is actually that you see that individuals that carry this variant have a decreased probability to become long-lived. So the odds ratio is below one and it's very consistent across populations. So not only European populations, but also in um, East Asian populations and even in the African American population from the US. If you look at the E2 allele, we actually see the opposite effect. So this allele is a protective allele. If, we, if you carry this variant, you actually have an increased chance of becoming long-lived. It's also very consistent, but the effect size is a little bit smaller. And that is also why we only picked it up when we really increased our sample size in our latest GWASs. So this is, in short, a summary on the right side, then, of the genetic studies that have so far been done. So we have APOE, which is the A4 allele, and E2 allele. We had FOXO3 coming with mostly from this Canada gene studies. And there have been several approaches, which I will not go into, which also show that the combined genetic variation in insulin signaling is also associated with longevity. But then I thought, okay, what can I do differently? I don't want to keep studying this common genetic variance. So let's move a bit away from that and look at the more rare variants. So variants that are not so much present in the population in a frequency that's it's something like 0.01 or even lower in our, in our case. However, then we run into a problem because statistically we can hardly prove that this is actually contributing to, to survival. If you have a, a two carriers versus zero carriers, statistically you cannot make any sense of that. And it's therefore also not possible to show any causality in humans. So what I decided to do then is actually do functional studies. And these functional studies can then be done in cellular models, and they can subsequently be done in model organisms. But then you have to think, okay, with which kind of genes, with which variants should I start? And I decided to focus on, on genes that are already found in model organisms, or actually pathways that are already found in model organisms, go back to this very long-lived people, 
look for rare variants in these genes and use that as starting material for the follow-up work. So this is actually the group uh, that is working on this at the moment. And the, the, the pipeline consists of two different steps. So the first step is that we do in vitro characterization of the genetic variants. But to do that, we first, of course, have to identify them. So we created this pipeline for the identification of these variants. So they have to be located in the lifespan associate gene coming from studies in model organisms. So it can be a gene in a pathway. It doesn't have to be a conserved gene. It can also be a gene in a conserved pathway. It needs to be protein altering, which, and, and it has to, be an, has to show a combined annotation depletion score above 20. And this means that it's predicted to be changing the protein function bioinformatically. Then we use two different studies. So we use the Lai Longevity study, which is this family-based study which I showed before, which contains individuals that were inc included when they were above 90 years of age. And then we also use another population, which is the German longevity study, which is actually containing long-lived singletons, so individuals, in this case above 95 years of age, without any known fam fam family history for longevity. And of course, the pathway that we focus on first is not surprising, the insulin signaling pathway, given all the evidence, not only coming from FOXO3, for example, but mostly actually from the studies in the model organisms. This is, I would say, the pathway for model organisms that shows the strongest evidence uh, for longevity. So what we then do is that we actually take this variants that we identify and we use CRISPR to bring them into cell lines. And we actually use a mouse embryonic stem cell line because we can grow it indefinitely. It's very easy to target and it brings us already closer to translation to the mouse. So I'm not doing the translation from the animal models to the humans, but I actually want to do the opposite translation. I want to start with the humans, bring it to the model organisms to prove causality. So that is the reason that we decided to use this, um, this cell model. And then what we then do is do in-depth analysis uh, of the protein under study. So it's based on the pathway. So we, for example, look at insulin IGF signaling activity as shown here. So on the left, you actually see an example of two different variants in one protein, where actually this one variant increases the level of the protein, while the other one decreases the levels of the protein. And if you then look at S6K, which is a readout of mTOR activity, you actually see that both variants reduce the activity of S6, um, and in one case it's significant. And actually, in, in, if you look at AKT, also this one variant actually increases um, the phosphorylation of AKT. And this effect that we are seeing here is similar to what we would see with treatment with rapamycin. So do we see actually a mild rapamycin effect caused by this specific variant. So what we then did is we took all the variants that we created, all these different cell lines, and then did uh, RNA sequencing analysis. And also actually we did now the same with proteomics. And then if we, if we cluster these um, just with the, the very simple principal component analysis, we can actually see that there are two different cellular states. So we have on the top, we have the wild type state, which is kind of the wild type cells plus one control cell line, which we should show the same as the wild type. And then we have state number one, which is on the left, containing three different cell lines, and state number two on the right, containing around seven different cell lines. So we can actually see a very strong clustering already with these variants. And this is actually what we are looking for, because we're hoping that although the variants that we identify are in different genes, in different individuals, that the downstream effects are quite similar between them. And we are currently diving into this to find out what these states actually mean. The second thing that we are doing is that the most interesting variants that we identified in the beginning, we actually already brought forward to the mouse. So what we did there is again, we used CRISPR-Cas9 gene editing and created mouse lines containing these specific variants. And then we actually have the variants in the heterozygous state and in the homozygous state. And this is very important because in the cell lines, we just have them in the homozygous state. But we actually want to see what they are doing in the heterozygous state because that is the state in which we identify them in the humans. And here on the left, again, you see the data uh, from this protein X, and you should look at the blue variant where we saw this upregulation of this expression of this protein. And if we then go to the liver of the mice, we actually see also that this protein is upregulated, but it's very, it, it's male specific. If we then go to the muscle, we actually see that this protein is upregulated in the females. So we also see very clear sex differences. And this is something that we want to take into account as well. So all the analysis that we are doing, we're doing both in male and female mice, because we know that for many of these things, we can ex expect actually sex differences. 
So then we do also, of course, an in-depth characterization of the mice. So we, do, we are running lifespan cohorts, which are currently ongoing, but will take quite some time before they are finished. We do uh, extensive phenotyping, and we do then also more detailed tissue collection. Um, but one thing that we already found very early on was actually, if we looked at the litter size of the mice carrying two different variants, uh, in, again, in this, in this one protein, that for one of these variants, which was the one with the high expression of this protein, we see actually that the litter size is about one to two mice bigger than normal. So actually, they are actually very sexually active. Um, so we don't know yet what this means. We are currently actually looking into the testes and the ovaries of these mice to see if we can find out what is happening there, why this actually is the case. But then we also do this, like I said, this in-depth characterization. So we do that three times during their life. We, do, we phenotype them at young age, which we have just finished for these two lines. We do also middle age and we do late age. And we do many different tests. So we do basic metabolic phenotyping, but also do, for example, insulin signaling tests, insulin signaling related tests like insulin resistance and glucose tolerance tests. And this is actually one of the, 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 the strongest findings we actually have. And be aware this is young age. So we wouldn't actually expect to see much already at young age, but we actually see some very strong effects already there. And one thing is that if you look at the, at the left, on the left side, the body size of the females is smaller in comparison to the, the wild type mice. For the heterozygote mice, they are somewhere in between, but the homozygote mice, we can clearly see that they are smaller. And we also have replicated it not only in the phenotyping cohort, but also in some of the tissue collection cohort. And we actually think that it has to do that they have a lower percentage of fat. So their fat mass is reduced, and that probably leads to the fact that they are a bit smaller. Another thing that we found very striking was actually if we look at rotor rot, which is a, a measure of motor coordination or activity in these mice, then we also see a very female-specific effect. What, how you should interpret this plot is that we put them on this rotor rot for four different days, and we, you should expect them to increase their learning over time, which is what we see. And then um, the longer they are on the rotor rot, so the, the, la the latency to fall increases, the better. So the higher the curves, the better. And we can clearly see that if we look at the, the right side, which is the females again, that both the heterozygote and the homozygote mice do better on the rotor rod. However, this can also be weight dependent. So we have to adjust also for the body weight in this case. And when we do this and we, we take the area under the curve uh, of, these, of these graphs, then we actually see it more clearly that both um, in the heterozygote state as well as the homozygote state, these mice are doing better. And we are also now uh, just going to start, I think, in a month, the, the second round of phenotyping of these mice. So we, we, are, we are very curious to see if we see the similar effects in, in middle age and maybe even more effects now because they are, are a bit older. So the take-home messages of my talk is actually that if we look at individuals from long-lived families, they show many metabolic profiles in middle age. I didn't went too much into it. I could have another talk about this as well, but I wanted to focus today more on the genetics. We also know that survival to an exceptional old age is actually partly heritable. How much it is, we don't know. And if we look at the large genome-wide association studies, they have identified only a very, number, a very limited number of genetic variants associated with longevity. And therefore, we actually assume that longevity is probably not caused by common genetic variants, but mo most likely by rare genetic variants. And these rare genetic variants can even be family specific. This is potentially what we are seeing actually in the light longevity study. Um, and if we take these rare genetic variants and we put them into cells and mice, we can actually see that they have in, uh, in vivo uh, an in vitro effect. And the next step would then be for us to now see if we can find these effects, can we mimic them with specific kind of interventions, which we will do at the cellular level, for example, with specific kind of drugs, to see what we can learn, if we can learn from these long-lived individuals, take their variants and actually do the same trick with different drugs or interventions. One thing I also wanted to mention that about the genetics, before I forget, is actually what I think that actually we're seeing in Okinawa and the other blue zones is very likely not the same as what we are seeing here in the Netherlands. I think the, the blue zones have something specific. I think in the blue zones, it's more related to diet or, uh, or environmental factors potentially in combination with the genetics, so the gene environment interve and interventions. But in the Dutch population and this more normal population, we really think that the genetic effect might be a bit more strong because they are a bit more diverse. 
So thank you for your attention. The other question I had, uh, Brenner from San Diego, was that um, as a non-geneticist, why do we not see the FOXO3 in, in the GWAS? Because it seems like it'd be common enough that you would. Yeah, so the thing is that if you look in the GWAS, we look at all these populations at the same time. So there are some populations that don't show the effect. And this is the, the thing. If you look at publications, people only publish positive results. So all the people that publish about FOXO, they have found in their population. But we know that there are some populations that don't show it. Another thing that you should take into account is with this genome-wide association studies, we are very strict because we test, in this case, 30 million variants. We have to correct for uh, some kind of multiple testing. So this is a very stringent uh, threshold, which is at the moment at 5 times 10 to the minus 8. So FOXO pops up but it's something around 10 to the minus 4, 10 to the minus 5. But if we would that, take that as a threshold, we would identify many more variants, and we don't know which are false positives then and which are true positives. So I'm not saying that FOXO3 is not true. I'm just thinking that it's probably more very um, population-specific, and in some populations FOXO is there, in some it's not, which also, again, uh, highlights the point that I think that many of the variants might be population specific and might be even family specific. And APOE4 is actually quite surprising, always there. I'm still very surprised about that. This is so consistently, when, whenever you test it, in any population you'll find the APOE4 allele to be deleterious. So, but why that is, we don't know. Thanks a lot. Uh, I have a comment and a question. A comment is that uh, I think it's a great strategy to um, do the mutation discovery in humans and then go to the animal, as you described. Uh, you, uh, but I think you agree that selecting, when you use bioinformatic prediction of functional deficiency, making the right choices is quite risky. I mean, uh, you obviously you have a hit here. So that, that, that's just a comment. So congratulations yeah. on. Yeah. So I wanted. I mean, I wanted to to to, to comment on that. So I was also not expecting to see such striking effects. I mean, I was trying this out and thought, okay, there might be some that do something, some that don't do something. But it really seems that all the variants we brought in, that they do something. We still don't know if it's something healthy or unhealthy because it could also be that as long as people carry this variant in the heterozygote state, and that. The, the wild type allele is protecting them from the negative effects. So you should always yeah. take that into account. We cannot say that it's for sure healthy, but the fact that we see this functional effects um, actually shows that the pipeline is working and that this filtering is probably a good way, a good strategy. Another thing related to that is yes, we are also biased because we focus on insulin signaling. I mean, ideally I wanted to do this unbiased, mm -hmm. completely unbiased, but if we do this in the genome unbiased, you end up with thousands of variants that you can study. So that makes it also very difficult. But you included more than uh, premature stop. You, ha you had a score of bioinformatics, but and that's, was that more generous or, le or did you only include basically truncate stop codon or frame shift truncated? Uh, no, no, actually most of them are just uh, point mutations. Substitute. So okay. they are they're protein altering, just a, a, a one amino acid change. And the nice thing what we also realized when we did this, which we weren't sure about, is that the ones that we follow up are conserved in mice because we use this strategy and we go for protein altering ones. It's also more likely that they are directly conserved in mice. So the nice thing is we can just make the mutation in the mouse as it is in the humans, which is for, thi for things like APOE and also for FOXO, yeah. actually a problem because these variants are not conserved. But in our case, they are, so we can directly uh, look at them. And, and just final uh, question, uh, I'm, since what you showed, it's clearly implicated some kind of dysmetabolic or pro-metabolic if you turn it around. So did you uh, do any m metabolomic screening in these uh, mice in carriers and non-carriers and do you have some hits there, so some clear patterns in the metabolome? That is actually what we want to do. So we, we, we are now collecting uh, first all the tissues from these mice, and then the idea is that we want to do, when we have all the three the time points, we want to do metabolomics and proteomics, um, potentially even RNA-seq on as many tissues as we can, money uh, <laughs> depending, of course, but we then want to see what we are seeing there. From the cells, we have done 
um, already RNA sequencing and proteomics, but not yet uh, untargeted metabolomics. But this is something that we definitely want to do to really see what's happening. But the fact that we see such strong effects at the RNA-seq level, which are accompanied by similar effects at the protein level, hints towards that the metabolome would also show something like this. But in the mice, we have to see. It's work in progress. So, thank you again. Great presentation, Dr. Deling, for amazing, amazing final presentation. And now we would like to have the final remarks from Ule Medanda. Let me just uh, end this day like we started to a, a great thank to Professor Suzuki because without you, probably, well, we, we might have lived, but we wouldn't be here at this. Uh, so thank you so much. And, and uh, thanks to the speakers, um, for, to anyone, everyone in the audience. It was uh, 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 really enjoyable and um, hope that we'll see everyone uh, tomorrow morning again. And um, uh, since we have such a nice environment outside, I'm not going to say so much more, more than we might have, do we have any practical things to announce or nothing? Oh, oh, so the bus is waiting for us. Not so. Uh, just we need to go straight to the shuttle bus for those speakers, and that's all. And then, yeah, tomorrow will be nine o'clock. That's all. Thank you very much.